Hello and welcome to my first lecture on opiate narcotics. Uh, this will be a two-part series where I'll be talking about opium, morphine, heroin, and a variety of other really interesting drugs which have both a very fascinating history and really some uh, current, uh, very interesting current trends and a lot of good stuff to talk about. But in the interest of keeping things kind of sensible and orderly, I've broken it up into two lectures. In this first lecture, I'll just introduce this term narcotics. Obviously, you've heard it before. I just used it a second ago. I'll talk a little bit about the history of the opiates, which is a class of drugs which I'm using, uh, that name I'm using somewhat synonymously with narcotics. And I'll talk a little bit about some of the medical uses and potential misuses of opiate uh, drugs. Okay, so narcotics. Now, again, you've heard this word before. And often the term narcotic is just used to generally refer to any drug. So um, sometimes police forces will have a narcotics uh, task force or a narcotics division. Um, for our purposes though, we're going to use the word narcotics a little bit more precisely and we're going to use it based on its root, which is narcosis. Narcosis meaning a state of numbness or reduced pain and also uh, accompanied by uh, feelings of sleepiness. So in that context, narcotics are drugs which induce this kind of numb, sleepy, dreamlike feeling. And that's why uh, you know, we often, at least in terms of psychology and pharmacology and clinical practice, we talk about narcotics, meaning most specifically the opiates, because that's the class of drugs which most um, consistently and most effectively produce a kind of a numb, dreamy, sleepy feeling for, for patients. Now, the opiates are really broad group of drugs, which can be subdivided into some subgroups. There's the, the opiates themselves that are all the drugs which are derived directly from opium. So there's opium, which we'll talk about in just a second. You can make from that morphine and codeine and thebane. Then there are opiate derivatives, which are derived from morphine. So they've, we've chemically uh, altered morphine to produce things like heroin or oxymorphone, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then there are a whole class of drugs, they're called synthetic opiates, which are not made at all from opium or opium derivatives, but are uh, devised in the laboratory from reagents, but chemically resemble or uh, pharmacologically act like the opiates. So a lot of different drugs. and. Um, you know, for the purposes of this lecture, it's not necessary that we precisely memorize all these distinctions, but I'm giving you this figure here just to give you a sense of the diversity of drugs which we all kind of group together under the term opiates. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the history of these drugs. Now, as I, I've said in previous lectures, the history of this drug uh, begins with the history of a plant that plant being the Papaver somniferum, or the poppy that brings sleep. And you almost certainly uh, have heard of this before. Um, this is a particular species of poppy which is native to the Middle East and Asia and is the source of opium. So for instance, if you were to just um, walk through a field of opium poppies and see the kind of large bulb-like heads of them, you could, with a knife, scratch the edge, and after a period of time, a kind of a milky colored sap would start to ooze out. If you scraped away that sap and let it dry, it would dry to kind of a dark brown or almost black color, and you would have opium. And people have uh, known about this for literally millennia. Uh, I've had in this class students in past semesters who are in the military or and are on active duty in Afghanistan and have talked about um, you know, either walking through opium uh, fields or, uh, you know, opium poppy fields or even being part of group uh, task forces um, uh, tasked with destroying poppy fields. So it's an ancient history, it's a modern history. And as I just said, um, you know, this history is truly ancient. If we go back, you know, to thousands or hundreds or even thousands of years BC, we can see evidence for what looks like the use of uh, opium in medicine. So for instance, um, there's a particular uh, papyrus fragment that was discovered, which has been dated back to 1500 BC. Uh, it's called the Ebers uh, papyrus, and it's kind of a, a pharmacopoeia. It's a list of the known medicines at the time and, and the different uh, disorders or illnesses that they were thought to treat. And it includes uh, uh, records of how to um, prepare opium and administer it. So it could be, uh, for instance, smoked. You can see uh, here a, um, a 
a uh, relief carving from a temple in Cyprus that's been dated back to about 200 BC and you can see someone smoking a substance that might not necessarily be opium but from uh, this archaeological find and other archaeological finds we know that people in the ancient world were using opium for a variety of purposes including medicinal purposes. A little bit later in history, in the 11th and 12th century, uh, European um, invaders and crusaders um, went to the Middle East and um, set up uh, empires and began to uh, set up trade routes. And among the other commodities that were traded uh, into Europe at that time uh, was opium, kind of introducing opium to um, much of the rest of, uh, well, to the rest of Europe. It had been known in the Middle East and, and in Asia uh, for many centuries before, but opium during that period of time kind of came to Europe, if you will. And then later on, you know, still later in history in the 15th and 16th century, uh, kind of the age of exploration, the age of colonization, uh, as we've discussed before in the lecture on uh, caffeine, if you think back to um, tea trading and coffee trading, uh, this was a period of time in history when European um, countries were establishing colonies and trade empires. And part of those empires uh, were trades in spices and trade in tobacco um, and also trade in opium. Again, I covered this a little bit in a previous lecture and you may recall uh, the kind of the trade system that the English set up uh, trading opium uh, for tea to kind of finance their uh, tea trade. Kind of roughly during the same time period, um, you know, opium was being used in a variety of different ways. It was still used medicinally quite a lot. Um, it was used in a substance which you might have heard about, you might have read about if you like to read history as I do. That substance is called laudanum, which was uh, invented by a rather obscure uh, Swiss, Swiss physician who went by the name of Paracelsus. Um, he basically created a combination of uh, opium and wine and a variety of spices which were thought to have medicinal properties and um, you could give someone uh, opium and it would numb up any pain that they were having and would put them into kind of a relaxed comfortable state. Uh, the word laudanum means something to be praised or that which is praiseworthy uh, because at the time there were very few options for medical treatments of any diseases. I mean this is something which I know, perhaps is obvious to, to some of you. It's something that I guess I've thought about over the years as I've read and taught about drugs. But you know, nowadays, if you're sick or injured, you know, you trust that there's a fair bit <clears throat> that, <clears throat> that science and medicine can do to help you. Now, of course, it's very sad or even tragic when you're injured or sick and you know, there's no medicine to treat you or no cure for the disease. But it's worth reflecting that <clears throat> in the vast majority of human history, uh, that was the case for everyone. You know, if you got sick or if you got injured, there were no cures or few cures for most of the things that could make you sick or could injure you. And the best that medicine could do was really to provide relief of pain and give you time to hopefully recover on your own or if not, to die peacefully. And alcohol was probably one of the major tools for doing that to help people uh, feel less pain and feel more comfort. Opium, opium mixed with alcohol in, in laudanum was another, uh, was a, the other big option and was a major advance. You know, if, you, uh, if you got injured, if you were sick and dying, there wasn't much that medicine could do for you other than ease your passage and laudanum was a way to do that. And again, laudanum was invented way back in the 1400s, we think. But as recently as the turn of the 20th century, laudanum was still being used. I actually uh, found these old uh, pictures online. Um, this is from the, uh, as you can see, from the Northern Drug Company of Duluth. So kind of in our neck of the woods, or at least in my neck of the woods as I'm recording here in Fargo, North Dakota. And you could see that uh, people right up through the early part of the 20th century were selling laudanum. So if you were um, a homesteader or a, you know, a rancher, or you know, working on the rail lines up here in the upper Midwest during that time period and you got sick or you got injured, you might not ever be able to see a doctor if no one lived in your town or even if they did, there might not be a lot they could do for you. You probably would have a stash of laudanum in your house that you could use to ease your suffering and hopefully you'd have a chance to uh, recover. Anyway, interesting picture. I love old pictures like this. So part of the history of opium is kind of this history of this medicinal use. Another part of the history is the history of a really violent and unpleasant drug war. And that drug war, or wars, we now know in history as the Opium Wars. And these were fought between European powers and China uh, during the 18th century. 
So if you recall from previous lectures, I kind of mentioned this a little bit, but in the 18th century, uh, Britain had essentially conquered and colonized um, much of, well, pretty much all of what's now India and Pakistan, including the area of Bengal. Um, this was a rich uh, farmland where you could grow an awful lot of stuff, including an awful lot of opium poppy. And uh, by controlling much of the world's supply of opium, Britain had a really powerful way of manipulating trade in a variety of other commodities, including, as I've talked about earlier, tea. Um, now, during the same period of time uh, in China, smoking of opium was increasing in popularity. Now, people had smoked opium for centuries or maybe even millennia before that, but the popularity of smoking opium, especially in China, really took off because it was about during this, uh, during this time period, because it was about at this time that the tobacco trade uh, from the Americas was really kicking into gear. And people around the world, including in China, found that if you uh, smoked tobacco but put kind of a, a tincture or kind of a dry, you know, small concentrated dose of opium on top of it, you could get a really powerful high because smoking tobacco um, from a pipe is relatively easy to do. Um, the smoking, burning uh, tobacco will melt the kind uh, the um, the opium and help it to vaporize, making it easier for you to smoke, and uh, you can get a very strong, very quick, <clears throat> very powerful high. So again, smoking opium was not entirely new, but uh, during the uh, you know 1700s and into the 1800s, and certainly even much later, um, people. Uh, around the world, but including in China, took up the habit of smoking tobacco with, uh, with opium laced into it, as you can see here from this picture uh, from the early 1900s. Um, and as again, I, I said this a little bit earlier, um, but smoking in this way allowed for easier smoking, which meant a faster, stronger high from the opium. And generally we see with all drugs, or pretty much all drugs that we've talked about, um, to the extent that you can get a faster, stronger effect, uh, you, there is greater risk for dependence or addiction. Uh, and that's true for a variety of drugs. It's true for opium and the other opiate drugs as well. So as I said, um, uh, you know, this was a, a the use of opium in this way grew in popularity in China uh, to the great ruin of a lot of the Chinese empire. You know, massive numbers of people were becoming addicted to opium. Uh, it was a, causing huge social problems. And the emperor of China outlawed the uh, use of opium, or at least attempted to at a couple different points in time. And Britain, France, and America went to war against China to uh, maintain their right to trade uh, opium in China, basically fighting a war and taking over China to establish zones of economic control uh, in which uh, they could basically force the trade in opium to stay legal. Um, kind of a, a disturbing, uh, you know, a disturbing part of our history. Uh, one that I think it's worth reflecting on and being kind of honest about. As I've mentioned in previous lectures, I think it's it's just interesting to reflect upon the fact that nowadays, if you say war on drugs, it conjures images of Americans going to other countries to fight the drugs which are coming to us. So whether that's, um, <clears throat> you know, members of the DEA uh, in South America, you know, uh, spraying um, defoliant on a cocaine growing field or co cocaine growing forests and fields or whether that's members of the army and other military branches in Afghanistan destroying poppy fields. Um, that's our idea I think nowadays uh, of what a war on drugs looks like or maybe policing in our own towns and cities. Um, it's worth reflecting that there were real honest to God wars with ships and soldiers and cannons and huge casualties on all sides that were fought to maintain the drug trade uh, back in the day and to maintain the drug trade for great profit for America, for France, for Britain and other countries as well. I have a, a couple interesting links to some uh, shows from the History Channel that cover the Opium Wars and I'll link to them on Blackboard. So if you're curious about this stuff, uh, by all means take a few extra minutes and watch those video clips. So, so anyway, just in terms of our history, we're kind of in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, and opium is available in a variety of places in a variety of different forms pretty much all around the world, including in Europe and in America. And it's interesting to note that there were kind of a, there was sort of a split in attitude about how opium could be used or what was the safe or socially appropriate way to use this drug and what was the unsafe and not socially appropriate way to use this drug.
during this time period, um, smoking opium was seen as this kind of dangerous and addictive practice, something that was associated with lower class people, especially immigrants in America, especially Chinese immigrants, and a great deal of, um, there was a great deal of uh, racial prejudice, or racism, frankly, against immigrants, especially Chinese immigrants, especially on the west coast of the United States during the 1800s and 1900s. And so uh, it wasn't the case that these people were the only folks using uh, smoking opium, uh, but they were sort of associated with this practice for kind of obvious historical reasons, and they were seen as dangerous uh, members of society who uh, we should all be worried about. Um, interestingly, at exactly the same time, drinking opium in the form of laudanum and other kind of patent medicines and pharmaceuticals was seen as essentially a very safe and socially acceptable thing to do. You know, these, these were medicines, they were safe, you didn't need to worry about them, especially if you were a woman and might have or might face some social um, social uh, prohibition against drinking uh, alcohol that is you know, women at least in the 1800s in some places were sort of discouraged from drinking alcohol but they could drink uh, you know uh, medicines for various real or imagined health complaints many of these medicines including large amounts of, uh, of uh, alcohol and opium and other drugs as well um, you know, as I've talked about in previous lectures, it's the same time period that I find kind of fascinating, the sort of the 1800s and into the 1900s, when, um, when uh, pharmacology and chemistry are really coming into their own as sciences, and um, clever chemists and clever pharmacologists begin to extract and tinker with the different uh, compounds, different alkaloids especially, that are found in natural sources like plants and fungi. One of these people, again, there so many of them are Germans or people who studied in Germany, was Frederick Wilhelm Adam Surtener. Uh, almost certain I got that pronunciation correct, so good for me. He was the person who was able to isolate first morphine from opium. So again, that opium sap that you could get straight from the poppy contains actually three different uh, active compounds. One is morphine, the other is codeine, and the third is thebane. And each of them have kind of narcotic effects upon people, but morphine is the strongest one. And so by isolating just the morphine from the opium, Surtener was able to create a really powerful, powerful narcotic. He called it morphine because, you know, like many people, like myself, he was interested in classical mythology. And as you know from classical mythology or from watching those Matrix movies, Morpheus is the god of sleep and dreaming. And morphine, you know, if we want to you know, guess about it or look at some of the pharmacological research is at least 10 times stronger than opium. So small amounts of morphine give you as big a punch as relatively large amounts of opium. And morphine was used, like opium, in a lot of different medicinal products at the time. Um, this is just one of them. Uh, Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup, which was tremendously popular, was a, uh, a medication that was given, that mothers could give to their children, especially when they were teething. Recall in the previous lecture I talked about cocaine uh, tooth drops that would sort of numb a child's gum. If your kid wasn't getting enough numbing effect from the cocaine you were giving her, you could give her also some morphine. Um, and I guess it's, I'm sort of chuckling about this now. Um, the truth is, of course, this could be tremendously dangerous because you could easily overdose your child and kill them. But uh, having lived through, while well, we're still in this process, two young children, toddler age, fussing and crying, I won't lie, there were times I thought to myself, gosh, I wish you could still give morphine to children just to quiet them down. Well, not really, but I had the thought. And certainly back in the day, back in the late 1800s and into the early 1900s, people did this and it was widely available. It's also worth noting that back in the day, at least in this time period, morphine and other opiates were used and were, were marketed as a cure for uh, alcohol addiction. So the White Star Secret Liquor Cure was essentially large amounts of morphine that you could get um, in a, you know, you could order it as you might be able to see in the print here from the Sears and Roebuck catalog and could have it delivered to your, your house or to your farm. Um, 
It's a secret cure that will help you get off the alcohol. I recall that during this time period, uh, prohibition as a, a temperance and prohibition as social movements were kind of rising in popularity. People were starting to recognize that alcohol could be a very dangerous drug for both for individuals and for society in general. And as often happens in history, folks looked around for a, a quick fix or an easy cure for, for one problem, alcohol addiction, and thought that this new drug, morphine, which was so strong and powerful would be a much better um, would be a way to get people off alcohol so if someone's withdrawing from alcohol and they're very agitated and they can even be having hallucinations and they might certainly have a very strong craving to drink and be very uh, irritable and, and or depressed or even suicidal if you gave them morphine it calmed them right down so it probably had some benefit although of course there was huge addic uh, potential risk in addiction to morphine um, you know, obvious, sometimes, as we see in history, the solution to one problem becomes its own problem. Another interesting thing that happened at about the same time in history was the invention of the modern hypodermic needle that allowed for intravenous injection of drugs, including morphine. Um, this was invented uh, around the time of the, Amer you know, sort of time period-wise of the American Civil War and the Franco-Prussian War, and uh, injection of morphine was a really powerful advance in medicine, especially for treating injuries on the battlefield or treating uh, injuries and treatments like um, uh, amputation of limbs when soldiers were injured in war. So if someone was on the battlefield and needed quick treatment for pain, you could inject morphine into them and they would very quickly uh, have a blockage of pain. You know, they wouldn't be able to feel that their limbs had been grievously injured. If someone was recovering in a hospital and their, their leg or their arm had to be amputated, uh, opiates, especially morphine, especially injectable morphine, were really important advances. I mean, certainly that's still true today. So there was, in some ways, of course, tremendous benefit from these technological advances, uh, but there were also tremendous costs. One cost being uh, the rise in morphine addiction. Morphine by itself could be very uh, powerful. If you sort of consumed it orally, it could be very addictive. Injecting it gave an even quicker, even stronger effect of the drug. And as we've seen before, generally speaking, if you can take a drug and get it into the body, get it into the central nervous system fast, it's gonna have a strong effect. And strong effects, in most cases, are addictive effects. Not always, but in most cases. Morphine addiction became such a problem during this time period and so associated with people who were uh, soldiers that it was known as the soldier's disease. If you think back to the lecture on cocaine, I mentioned um, the inventor of Coca-Cola, uh, Pembroke. Gosh, I don't have my notes in front of me for that lecture right now. But he was a Civil War soldier who invented this mixture of cocaine and other medicinal products, or at least supposedly medicinal products, like caffeine and other flavorings, with the idea of weaning himself off of morphine. So again, you know, taking one drug and seeing it as the solution to another drug. You know, not to fault people or, or, uh, or judge them, but just to note that that's an interesting theme that seems to occur again and again in the history of drugs. Another interesting technological advance during this time period was the invention of heroin. Heroin was invented uh, uh, you know, during this time period by the Bayer Company, the same people who make your aspirin, or probably make the aspirin in your medicine closet. Uh, morphine is a opiate derivative, meaning that it's made by taking um, uh, heroin is an opium derivative, meaning it's made by taking morphine and chemically tinkering with it to make it more powerful. And um, morphine, or I'm sorry, heroin was originally marketed as a powerful cough suppressant, and it is, as are most opiates. And it was also marketed initially because it was thought to be not addictive. Um, this is another thing that s seems to come up again and again in the history of drugs. Uh, this idea that we can find a drug which will have all of the benefits we like, but none of the risks, or at least few of the risks. So we can find an opiate which won't be addictive like all those other opiates. And that was the hope with heroin. Um, but it was a drug uh, which was, as we obviously know now, was even more addictive, or stronger certainly, and more addictive than morphine, you know, maybe four times as strong or, or more, and certainly could be, could be very, very addictive as well.
you know, by the way, you know, just to kind of illustrate how this works, how this idea of uh, derivation and synthesis works in pharmacology, here's um, you know, a schematic diagram of a morphine molecule. And you know, I'm not a chemist, and you don't need to know a lot of chemistry about this uh, to notice that this is what uh, morphine looks like, and this is what heroin looks like. Those two OH groups, which I think are hydroxy groups, are replaced chemically with two acetyl groups. Those are those um, you know, sort of uh, H3CO2 groups there, which kind of occupy roughly the same space on the molecule. Now, what chemists were able to do by making this substitution is make uh, heroin more fat soluble than morphine. So, so why is it that heroin is stronger than morphine? Well, they're both injectable. What's different about them is those acetyl groups make the molecule of heroin more fat soluble. And once uh, it because it's more fat soluble, it more quickly gets into the central nervous system by crossing the blood brain barrier. And once it's there, it's essentially morphine that got a, a fast ticket into the brain. So it gets into the brain faster and has much stronger effects as a result. So again, time period is, you know, into the 1900s, there was widespread use of opiates in all sorts of areas of society. People were using laudanum, old school laudanum, you know, opium and alcohol. People were using pet medicines like Mrs. Winslow's soothing syrup that were morphine and cocaine and other stuff mixed together. Soldiers were injecting morphine. People were probably in some parts of the world still smoking opium. And as we see a lot in history, there, as the popularity of a drug grows, so too do the concerns about the downsides or the risks of the drug, including in this case, the risk of addiction. There's this initial period of kind of naivete where people you know, understandably and hopefully wish that this new drug, whatever it is, will have all the benefits and none of the risks of all the other drugs, but that naivete gives way to a kind of a sense of, real, of realization and concern about the problems associated with widespread drug use. As I mentioned earlier, there was an enormous amount of racism during this time period. There's racism during our own time period, let's be honest. But a lot of the racism in the late 1800s and early 1900s among, you know, was directed towards Chinese and other Asian immigrants, especially on the west coast of the United States. And they were seen as being kind of a lower class, criminal, um, here to spread all sorts of social problems, here to spread their drug use, their horrible accounts of, uh, you know, women supposedly being lured away from their husbands and families and given opium by uh, sort of dangerous uh, Chinese immigrants and, and killed or raped or worse. You know, again, these were sensational accounts, most of them probably fictitious, but it stoked the fire of existing racism and encouraged uh, local um, governments to create bans, often very racist bans, against drugs and against uh, the people who were thought to be the purveyors of those drugs. So just as an example, San Francisco banned the smoking of opium in 1875. And during that same time period, um, if you were a white person, you could go buy your opium from a pharmacy in laudanum or in other forms, and that was perfectly legal and even socially acceptable. But if you were a Chinese person and you were thought to be smoking opium or providing smokable opium, then that was a criminal offense. Okay, so into the 1900s, uh, there are a couple pieces of federal uh, legislation that came up during this time period. I've mentioned these before, but I'm going to mention them again just because I think they're worth remembering. One was the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act, which uh, among its other provisions required that when you made a medication, you had to label what was in it. Uh, you also had to give some sort of indication as to whether those ingredients were habit forming or addictive. Uh, that's something we take for granted nowadays, as I've described before, or as you obviously know from your own life. You know, if you go to the pharmacy and you buy an over the counter medication or you get a prescription filled, it has all sorts of information about what the active ingredients are and some warnings about all sorts of risks, including risks for addiction. That wasn't true until the early 1900s. And, you know, they see, you know, the, um, cure that I showed you before, the White Star secret liquor cure, was literally a secret. No one knew at the time, other than the folks who made it, what was in it. And it was heroin, or well, not heroin, I think it was morphine. But anyway, um, that changed because of federal legislation. 
And then the Harrison Tax Act in 1914 um, empowered the federal government with uh, authority to tax and regulate interstate commerce, including interstate commerce of drugs. And it, it may not be super obvious unless you're someone who loves tax law, but one of the major ways that um, a government can control how available any something is, you know, whether it's drugs or, or you know, farm commodities or, or anything, is to regulate how that thing is taxed. So by being able to impose taxes on drugs which were manufactured and then sold to doctors and pharmacies and hospitals, the federal government could limit and regulate how much of the drugs were out in the, out in the uh, sort of circulating in, the, uh, in this society. It was really the first legislation or first federal legislation about regulating drug use. Which again is kind of an interesting thing. Um, maybe that's something that is a little surprising unless you've read history or thought about history. But you know, nowadays if you say the word drugs, probably the image that comes to mind in most people's minds is illegal drugs. And most of us, or all of us really, have grown up with the idea that a lot of drugs are just illegal to use, or it's hard to get them, or you have to have a doctor's prescription to get them. That idea of drugs being illegal and drugs being in any way regulated is an idea which is barely a hundred years old. Through the vast majority of human history, drugs were available and they were just there to be used and no one really cared about it. At least didn't care about it enough to really try too awful hard to regulate it. Anyway, uh, enough, uh, enough opining, let's move on. Uh, by the 1920s, um, you know, there are a couple of Supreme Court decisions that kind of provided interpretation of the Harrison Tax Act. And essentially, a lot of drugs, including opiates, including especially heroin, became pretty illegal, uh, as they are today. And the use of opiates decreased quite considerably, but as is always the case, it didn't disappear. Rather, it went underground, like uh, cocaine did when we talked about the history of cocaine. By the 1960s and 1970s, uh, drugs kind of re-emerged. I mean, it's not that people had stopped using drugs. People had always been using drugs. People will always be using drugs. But during the 1960s and 70s, kind of associated with the protest movements and the counterculture of that time period, there was an increasing awareness of drugs and an increasing uh, willingness among people, especially white people, especially white middle class people, to experiment with drugs in a way that probably was less common during the 40s and 50s. Um, this led to an increase in drug use across the board, including an increase in use of opiates. There was also an increase in use of opiates um, among soldiers, at least during the Vietnam War period. Um, uh, opiates, um, including heroin, being uh, much more easily available and in pure, uh, much uh, purer quality um, in Asia, in Vietnam and elsewhere in Asia. Um, uh, there was a lot of concern at the time about soldiers returning home to the United States and bringing back with them their addictions. Um, interestingly enough though, the rates of addiction among uh, soldiers who'd used opiates and other drugs in uh, service, um, uh, was, you know, they, the, the rates of addiction among those people once they returned home were not much higher than the rates of addiction in the general population, suggesting that uh, absent the stresses of combat and absent some of the cues associated with using drugs, most of the folks, even the folks who'd used heroin or used other drugs on service when they came home, didn't continue to use. Some did, and of course this is a problem or was for many people a problem, but um, a lot of that concern was, in a way, uh, was, was not uh, founded, as it ultimately turned out. There's a really good uh, link that I'll put on Blackboard about this that looks a little bit at the history of heroin uh, during uh, the Vietnam War period. So anyway, by the 1970s, um, uh, for the Comprehensive Drug Control Act, uh, heroin and other opiates were put on Schedule 1. Uh, seen as having uh, no medical use and a high potential for abuse. Again, we can kind of scratch our heads at this a little bit because there are clearly a lot of medical uses for opiates, uh, but the risk for uh, abuse and dependence is certainly uh, cannot be denied. During the 70s and 80s, there were a series of, uh, kind of pharmaceutical breakthroughs that created many of the synthetic opiates that uh, I mentioned briefly at the beginning of the class. These are drugs which are, uh, you know, designed from chemical reagents in the laboratory. They're not derived from morphine or, or from ultimately from opium, the plant. They're made just artificially, if you will, in the laboratory or synthetically. Um, 
they either chemically resemble or pharmacologically act like the opiates. Many of them are, inc are incredibly uh, are incredibly uh, powerful. So um, you know some of the drugs like uh, you know uh, 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 methadone, for instance, or tramadol, or, or uh, you know Darvacet, or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, were all kind of developed during the 70s and 80s. Um, during this time period, there's also the um, you know the appearance, at least in America, of what's called black tar heroin. This is a relatively cheap form of heroin, uh, which is um, smuggled, at least in recent history, has been smuggled into the country from Mexico and elsewhere in Central America. It's relatively cheap uh, to produce. It's relatively cheap and easily available. From talking to um, detectives who work on the narcotics task force here in Fargo, North Dakota, um, they've confirmed for me that most of the heroin which we see in this part of the country is probably or almost certainly traced back to Mexico. Um, in the 90s and 2000s, uh, the purity of heroin, generally speaking, has increased, which has had some interesting consequences. It allows for the snorting and smoking of this drug. You know, when we think of heroin, we often imagine someone injecting heroin, and this is true for many users, and it has been for a long time. Part of the reason why people inject heroin is, uh, for a lot of its history, heroin has been relatively impure. So although you could crush it up and snort it, or you could try to vaporize and smoke it, you wouldn't get as much of a high. You get a, a better high or a faster high or stronger high from injecting it. Um, as the purity of heroin has gone up, and so more of the powder that you buy is actually really heroin and not just other uh, stuff that's been mixed in to cut the supply, um, the increased purity means you can get pretty high from snorting or smoking the drug. Um, this means that people who might want to use opiates but might be uh, anxious about using needles or anxious about catching diseases from intravenous injection now have a, a way to use the drug. Not as efficient a way as injecting, but one that's more accessible to them. Another kind of recent trend in opiates has just been the rise in prescription uh, prescriptions being written for pain management drugs, most of them opiate narcotics of one sort or another, and the rise in misuse and abuse of these drugs. So drugs like Oxycontin or Vicodin or Percocet or many of these other drugs uh, can be easily misused either by just taking too much of them, you know, taking four pills instead of one pill, or by crushing up the pills and snorting them, or by uh, heating them with a, a lighter to vaporize them and then smoking or inhaling the smoke that comes off of them. So we've seen in the last you know, 10 to 20 years a real rise in the rates of the um, misuse of these drugs and many of the problems associated with them. So just to briefly uh, highlight the, you know, one of those points I just made, um, if we look at people who are heroin users um, over the last, I mean, this is old data, I, I admit it's you know, just between 1994 and 1996, but it, it sort of illustrates the point I was making earlier about sniffing the drugs. Um, the, the rate of people who inject uh, the drugs, uh, inject heroin, has stayed kind of steady for a long period of time. If we extended this timeline, we'd see similar kind of steady levels for injection use of the drug. But what's been going up in the 1990s and continues through today is that, uh, you know, the number of people who are heroin users but are smoking or sniffing it. You know, because, again, the drug purity is, uh, is relatively better than it's been before, allowing for easier use during these, using these other routes of administration. Another trend has been the changes in patterns of opium um, and uh, other opiate availability because of the, uh, well, at least parts of the war on terror in Afghanistan. So uh, Afghanistan and areas um, in a little bit in Pakistan and elsewhere in the Middle East are what's called part of the Golden Crescent. The Golden Crescent is just a, a place where a lot of opium uh, comes from. Much of it is uh, turned into heroin and sold through Russia and into, the, into Europe and into the United States. So you can see here in red or kind of orangey color the um, sort of supply lines of, of opiates around the world. There's the black tar heroin coming out of Central America. There's the Golden Crescent heroin and the Golden Triangle heroin kind of coming to the United States. You can also interestingly see cocaine roots here as well. Uh, this data is, is from a New York Times article. It's a few years old, but it's the last time I checked, these roots are more or less the same. So nowadays, you know, roughly 80 or 90% of the world's supply of opium 
comes from Afghanistan. Almost all of it's turned into heroin. And like I said, it's sold um, through the Middle East to Europe, and some of it ends up in the United States, much more so on, <clears throat> on the East Coast than on the, uh, in the central part of the country. Like back when I lived in New Jersey and worked as a clinician there, um, there was a fair amount of opium, or I should say heroin, that was coming in uh, from Turkey at the time. I don't know this personally, but my clients who were heroin addicts uh, would tell me you know, where the different suppliers claimed they were getting their supply from. Anyway, let's move on and talk a little bit about some current trends in, uh, in opiate uh, use. One of them is the medical use of opiates. So in the next few slides, what I'd like to do is just uh, name and highlight a few of the more common uh, medical opiate narcotics and analgesics, which you may have heard of and which I think deserve a little bit of attention, both in terms of their clinical utility and in terms of their uh, potential for misuse and abuse. So the first is oxycodone or hydrocodone. Um, these are opiate derivatives, meaning like heroin, they're derived from morphine by chemically altering the structure of morphine, uh, which is of course derived more or less directly from the opium poppy. Vicodin, Vicodin and Percocet, these are opiate derivatives plus uh, acetaminophen. So if you want to uh, enhance the pain killing quality of a drug, you sometimes, or uh, a medication, you sometimes make it by combining multiple drugs. So uh, Vicodin and Percocet are just examples of taking an opiate and combining it with another analgesic, like acetaminophen from Tylenol, of course. And here are just a, you know, a table that has a few other uh, generic names and brand names and some rough sense of the relative potency of these drugs. So uh, I think I might have mentioned in an earlier slide that uh, during the 1980s, there's a real, and into the 90s, there's kind of an explosion in the development of these drugs. And some of them, as you can see, are really, are really quite, uh, quite potent. So relative to morphine, which we're giving a kind of a, num a numeric of one, uh, we have a drug like fentanyl, which is you know, hundreds of times more more uh, potent. And you can see also here the duration of time that these drugs are active in. Um, and that actually is, is one of the goals of all this pharmacological tinkering, is to make a drug which maybe works more quickly or lasts longer. You know, notice that really almost all of these drugs were uh, developed uh, to manage pain. And so there's a value in be able, being able to give someone a drug which will block pain for a fairly long period of time if they're um, you know, in recovery from a surgery or if they're dealing with a chronic injury or other chronic pain problem. So again, the, the benefits of these drugs include things like pain management. So if you've been injured and you're suffering from pain, there are also some uh, effects that opiates have, and I'll discuss this really in my next lecture, but uh, among their other effects is they tend to slow the peristaltic process that moves food through your gastrointestinal system, uh, which is useful because they can slow down that activity if you've uh, sustained an injury to uh, your GI tract or if you've undergone surgery that's, that's uh, you know, uh, repaired or, or even removed part of your GI tract, or if you're suffering from a more common problem like just uh, gastrointestinal distress or diarrhea. Um, Imodium is a good example of a drug like that, which, uh, you know, is an opiate, uh, it's a synthetic opiate, and it will tend to slow down your digestive tract, um, which is good if you have diarrhea or really bad upset stomach. Uh, but it's also been engineered in such a way that it doesn't really very efficiently get into the um, central nervous system. So there's, it's very difficult, although not impossible, according to the internet, uh, to get much of a high off of Imodium. Another thing that these drugs do is they're fairly uh, good, generally speaking, fairly good antitussives, meaning they're good cough uh, treatments. So drugs like codeine or dextromethorphan are pretty good at quieting a severe cough. So you look at a, a drug, drug like codeine can be given sometimes uh, as an analgesic. It can also be given as an antitussive. It's actually an, uh, an opiate in the very technical sense and that it's derived directly from opium. Uh, dextromethorphan is a synthetic opiate, uh, which is developed as a replacement for codeine because it was thought to have somewhat lesser uh, potential for addiction. It gives you a little bit less of a high. Um, 
If you've ever taken Robitussin or similar cough medications, you can see uh, you may have taken uh, Robitussin DM. That DM stands for dextromethorphan, which you can see uh, you know, on this label right here. An interesting uh, you know, trend in the way people misuse and abuse drugs, uh, I'm not sure if this term is used anymore, but I remember back in college people talking about robo-tripping, which is essentially overdosing on Robitussin DM to get a high from that, uh, from that synthetic opiate dextromethorphan. Uh, whether or not that term is still in use, the practice still is. You know, one way that people uh, can get a high, a, a relatively cheap and uh, not exactly legal, but, but uh, you know, easier than buying drugs illegally type high is to overdose on these um, on non-prescription and prescription pain relievers and antitussives. Yeah, a term which is more cu more uh, current is uh, sipping syrup or lean or purple drink. Purple drink is a uh, it's usually purple it's a it's a drink which is made by combining usually Sprite cough syrup, especially cough syrup that has codeine or promethrazine in it, and sometimes adding Jolly Ranchers for flavor. So there's actually a, a whole very interesting um, sort of subgenre of hip hop music that uh, talks about and kind of um, celebrates and talks about the risks also of using uh, syrup or lean or drink. I've used uh, this guy as an example before. Lil Wayne has a lot of songs about drugs, and one of his that is actually, I think, pretty cool to listen to is Me and My Drank, which is uh, him basically rapping and singing about uh, being in his studio recording music while drinking, um, you know, a mixture of probably codeine and other uh, other stuff in his drink. Interestingly, this song, or I'll link to it on a Blackboard, there's a version of this song which has been chopped and screwed by DJ Trill. Chopped and screwed is another one, they somewhat obscure sort of subgenres of hip hop, which is uh, involves taking songs and specifically slowing them down and, uh, you know, with DJing tools, cutting them so as to create this kind of really weird, hypnotic, slow version of a song. So, Me and My Drink was already a kind of a slow song. The chopped and screwed version is even slower. And the common feature of, of both of these is that they often kind of involve or they talk about or they're sort of designed to be appreciated while you're really high on um, synthetic opiates. So, if you have a few minutes, it's well worth listening to, especially if you're not familiar with this type of music. I'll link to it on Blackboard where you can certainly find it if you just do searches on YouTube. Another drug which I wanted to mention is OxyContin. OxyContin is just a time-release version of oxycodone. And again, this makes sense. You know, the reason that people develop or pharma pharmacologists and uh, pharmaceutical companies develop different versions of painkillers is one, because pain management is a tricky art. And so a drug which might work for one person might not work for another. And two, uh, because when we do pain management, we typically want to have sustained periods without pain or with limited pain. So uh, one way to do that would be to uh, kind of engineer the pills of oxycodone in such a way that they dissolve rather slowly, providing a kind of a sustained slow release of pain blocking. Uh, what's interesting to notice, though, is that in recent years, uh, people who want to misuse and abuse these drugs have known have learned that you can either crush them up and snort them to get a pretty quick, powerful uh, opiate high, or you can uh, put them on a piece of aluminum foil and heat them with a you know with a cigarette lighter and inhale the smoke to get a similar effect. From talking to people in the pharmacy program here at NDSU, I've heard that in even more recent years, uh, pharmaceutical companies have been trying to overcome these problems by engineering pills that are very difficult to crush. You know, they dissolve in your stomach, but it's really, really hard to crush them into powder, or by tinkering with the composition of pills so that it's very difficult to burn them and vaporize the smoke. Um, it's almost like an arms race between people who develop pharmaceuticals and people who misuse pharmaceuticals. But, you know, regardless of how people are doing them, you uh, and I, I've talked about this before, there's been an increase in uh, the rate of the use and the misuse of these drugs in recent years. This uh, graph is based on data that's a little bit out of date, but it gives the general trend. We're looking at monitoring the future data here um, on all prescription opiates, uh, you know, sort of the uh, percentage of people who are reporting using them. Um, in the last 12 months, so the one-year prevalence of use of these drugs. And you can see that among 12th graders, you know, high school students has gone up quite significantly over the last uh, sort of couple decades. And if we look at just OxyContin within that group, that's gone up a little bit as well.
Now, prescription drug misuse, generally speaking, is the fastest growing drug problem in America, which is, I mentioned this before, I, I think it's worth repeating, because again, if, if you say to someone, drugs or drug abuse or addiction, probably the image that comes to their mind are things like people using heroin on the streets or people smoking marijuana or people taking psychedelic drugs. And that clearly happens. But when we think about a lot of the problems that come up with drugs, the fastest growing uh, you know, group of drug problems is related to misusing medications and especially misusing uh, opiate narcotics. You know, as I discussed earlier in the lecture on sedatives, people can certainly misuse prescription sedatives. When I did the lecture on stimulants, people clearly misuse prescription stimulants. But a real problem with misusing uh, prescription opiates is that they can kill you. There's a great risk for addiction or dependence and a great risk for overdose death. This is data, or rather this is a graph of data from the National Survey of Drug Use and Health. And you can see uh, here what we're looking at is the numbers of people who are um, who report having initiated their drug use with a particular drug. So of all the people who use drugs, we know what is the number of people who first started using marijuana and then went on to other drugs or first started using you know ecstasy and went on to other drugs and i should say here we're excluding alcohol and tobacco because those are almost always everyone's first drugs but if we look at people who are using drugs other than that uh, clearly the first drug uh, that many people go to is marijuana but it's notable or it's interesting to note that the second and the third are those prescription pain relievers and those prescription tranquilizers again kind of suggesting that as a uh, as a trend and as a kind of a, a fraction of all kind of new drug users it's people using these drugs which rank right up there almost as high as people starting to use marijuana yet another graph this time from the centers of disease control and here again it's a bit out of date but the trend is it would continue if i had a graph that extended up to 2015. Uh, you can see here the rates or not the rates but rather the raw numbers of deaths per year associated with heroin cocaine and opiate analgesics and you can see that there there are deaths um, from all these drugs the deaths from heroin uh, have been fairly steady over the years. The deaths from cocaine have gone up a bit, but it's that rise in abuse of opiate analgesics that I think concerns many, many people, uh, myself included, and certainly people who work in public health, people who work in addictions treatments. You know, this is a big issue. It's one of the biggest drug trends of the last you know couple decades. And again, uh, you can look at graphs all day if you find that stuff interesting. I kind of do. It's also worth noting that there are a fair number of celebrities in the recent years who've died from uh, overdoses of drugs, often combinations of drugs, but significantly, at least for the purpose of this lecture, combinations of drugs that have included opiate uh, analgesics and narcotics. So um, again, this is a bit out of date, I suppose, but you know, I remember Heath Ledger died of an overdose, Brittany Murphy, um, Michael Jackson, you know, a number of uh, folks, uh, musicians, uh, actors, etc., have died from overdoses that were at least in part contributed to by the use of these drugs. And once again, a graph from the Centers of Disease Control, for every one of these deaths, there are a fairly large number of people who are in treatment or who end up in an emergency room or who even end up uh, or who are um, abusing or dependent on the drug. So as, as tragic as a, as a death may be, and, and they, they all are, of course, um, there are many, many more people who are not dead, but hurt or addicted or are just continuing to misuse or use in a non-medical way this very powerful and potentially dangerous class of drugs. Okay, so that's, um, you know, I've been going for almost an hour here. That's probably enough of me talking. You probably need to take a break. Uh, I'll be back in the next lecture in this series, basically talking more about the opiates, talking about a little bit more about their current uh, rate of use and talking a little bit more about um, their pharmacology and about some of their acute and chronic effects. So thanks so much for paying attention to the lecture. As I always say, you know, thank you for your, your attention. I appreciate it. Um, I look forward to, to doing the next lecture in the series. I hope you look forward to watching it or listening to it. In the meantime, maybe take a quick break if you can. Go someplace relaxing or beautiful and you know, experience some, some nice rest before coming back for the next part of my series on opiates. Bye-bye.